in a molecular tumor board so i have not i have changed a little bit it's not like you know affording patient non affording patient because there's so much of confusion about the entity its utility and i have chosen today prostate cancer because that is even more confusing if you look at nccn guidelines it looks like every second patient that kind of patient that we see requires genetic analysis if you go by nccn guidelines but in reality i think barely 5 or 10% of prostate cancer patients i have not even 5% so are we missing something or is nccn sort of you know going overboard and i'll also show so that's why what i want when i'll be presenting this because we have experts here uh, the names are here and it's already been said represents the whole of the country there have been surveys in us so in us a lot of urologists so uro oncology street prostate cancer even they think very differently and people have not come to grips with the nccn no one would know i mean it's not possible even i don't remember all the nccn guidelines for prostate cancer so no one is expected to know but i think if you think logically and then see what is applicable okay so so the issue that we need to discuss do molecular tumor boards improve clinical outcome is it just one more exercise in futility we just spend time then do you believe in precision of n of 1 strategy clinical context when uh, uh, molecular aspects of prostate cancer are relevant pathways and genes to be evaluated as per clinical context because that varies which test germline or somatic or both lot of people are confused and they ask me yaar kya karne ka germline kare ki somatic kare and uh, you know it and then what to use for somatic testing the patient had a prostate biopsy you know so many course biopsy either that when patient has metastasis or you biopsy the metastasis or you use cell free dna you use uh, liquid biopsy then what do you do if your patient doesn't have access to or not willing to go to expert genetic counseling and that is very common scenario in india so the doctor who has ordered for the test they get sort of stuck with the patient because the, the you have ordered for the test you are supposed to guide the patient so what do you do so i am so we also request voting if you all uh, at least the experts and others also could scan so i am asking this is now for all solid tumors this is not for prostate specific so either you felt the need or you actually use a molecular tumor board and or genetic counseling in your practice so in what percent of solid tumor patient you have in whom you have done a somatic ngs panel or a pathway specific assay or a liquid biopsy it could be anything from the in your local hospital to foundation one whichever test you have used i feel the need for molecular tumor board guidance so uh, any people would like to vote at least the expert should vote the panel because that is how you all are. the organizers you yeah, how to vote i was told they have to okay so there is a qr code on each table you can either scan that or you use the https link that is being shown it is www.45thicon.com/voting once you go to the icon website there are four options you please select molecular oncology and then you can vote okay sorry this announcement should have been made earlier so just scan it open the qr code scanner and you know why this is important because you know we we do not really do not know what we want and if suppose you want to establish a molecular tumor board your the department or the administration say why do you need it so you have to have some basis not just because it should have it just is in fashion so we need some you know opinion that if you feel that in 50% of your patient you will be better off with a molecular tumor board guidance then it means it is needed if you feel you need it only for 2% cases then it means it is not needed i'll wait for a few minutes so those who already done they can familiarize themselves with the questions
it's done shall we or some people are still doing it done okay yeah so one by one you have to so you are expert and you know there's no right and wrong because if you look at the surveys done in us the responses go anywhere so this is you are talking about it is not a test of and whatever nccn right is not written on stone so i mean some panel there also decided what is there and many things what the right is actually people in the practice in the us community do not agree with and do not do that so you so the first question is in what percent you know, just write the number if you feel 50% 90% 5% for solid tumor patient somatic panel you think a molecular tumor board could help you or you might need that guidance done now the next question is again the same thing but this is for in these patient you have done a germ line test and here instead of a molecular tumor board in addition to that you need a genetic counselors input so that is a, a question number so maybe in 5% patient 95% patient 100% patients whatever uh, is your number okay so is it easy to navigate and uh, vote or difficult or impossible <laughs> okay i think that's all right we will go uh so we won't have the results so now i am asking this question for a well informed oncologist and there are different definitions of well informed oncologist but anyone i think most people in india you know whether in both corporate setting as well as an academic set setting are reasonably well informed can molecular tumor board provide additional guidance that could improve the clinical outcome of their cohort of patients so every hospital you have your own cohort of patient with different settings clinical outcome so the answers could be a would be for four yes in quite a few cases rarely if ever and you can say well for me it is a abstract concept i really do not know so whichever a b c i have not written a b c you could choose your responses and the second if if you the first answer is precision end of one strategy and just driven medicine do you believe in it answer could be a is not sure what it means yes in principle as well as in practice and c is theoretically appealing but hard to implement or get benefit out of it so okay now i'm just showing so i was surprised there has been a systematic review of the clinical outcomes of molecular tumor boards so Uh, so molecular tumor board is different from other you know uh, multidisciplinary tumor boards we have we also have in addition to all the oncologists also genetic counselors radiologists pathologists pharmacists and basic scientists so th they are also important the question on the limited the there's limited data on the clinical utility is it exercise in futility or the patient's benefit is it worth time and effort so actually what this uh, uh, this was found that there were 14 studies and they found that uh, there is actually benefit in patients who received the molecular tumor board recommended therapy that significantly better pfs as compared to those who received conventional therapy just whatever physician choice therapy so this looks like uh, i i i'm not sure but this is uh, limited data then this recent paper which came real world data from molecular tumor board demonstrates improved outcome with precision n of one strategy that means so there was uh, 429 patient on whom 265 had a therapy available you know uh, matched drug and so they were either some of them finally the physician decided so under a master protocol either physician used his or her own way of treatment or the molecular tumor board recommendation and what they found that patients who in whom were treated by the mtbs recommendation they did better so that is uh, that is one thing but of course i think there is a little bias there uh, you know because whenever it could whenever the mtb comes with the unequivocal recommendation it will also appeal to the you know physician and they will use that 
so you know that there are very classical cases but at least it shows that we don't confuse and overtreat and you know patients more patients don't die sometimes there's a possibility that just because you do more you might be killing patient so that is one thing but the n of 1 oncology look at this uh, this pembro keynote 158 so you know the number of prostate cancer patient was just one or maybe two in these patients so you say, but because you have called it all as non polarectal high MSI tumor, they have all clubbed together and you get a data of all the patients. But the response rates you look at, so for endometrial, which is a classical Lynch syndrome, the, uh, the OS is not even reached. It is more than 27 months to uh, not reached. Whereas for pancreatic, it is just four months and uh, median PFS. So what you can derive when you say N of 1, it is histology agnostic, tumor site agnostic. But when you look into the data, I think it is still a long way when you can say just in this one patient, what I have found, I will use that. So you use that very important information, but you have to go back and see the studies, larger studies from which this data was there. So maybe any of the experts here uh, from uh, Dr. Anita, would you like to say N of 1 strategy? Are you in this? Do you believe in this concept or do you think it is just uh, hype? Yeah, it differs from tumor to tumor. We okay. cannot generalize everything. Okay. Some are quite uh, responsive. Yes, molecular uh, uh, MTB tumor board, genetic counseling, doing an NGS. Mm -hmm. As in India, will help a small section of the society. Okay. But if you ask theoretically, I would love to do as per the guidelines, but I'm not able to do for most of my patients. So that's the practical. So right now we are not talking Discuss. because yeah. the issue is what to do. Then next mm -hmm. can, can we do it or not? The practical aspects mm -hmm. of logistics. I'm not getting into logistics now. I'm talking more of because the clarity first, the physician has to have clarity of thought. Then only mm -hmm. we start looking at as to what is it. Yeah. So maybe from the last, uh, the panel three, just uh, any one of you would want to comment. Utility of molecular tumor board or N of one concept. So I went through the paper after I saw that. So the paper was very nicely written. The, it signifies that every patient has got a different molecular signature. Mm -hmm. So the physician gives N number of options that is apt for that particular patient. But again, molecular tumor board goes through all the molecular reports and then they decide that, yes, this is the best option. Then the physician gives a confidence that, yes, I agree with this option. I do not agree with this option. What is your personal this thing? Do you agree with this N of 1 concept or it's just... I, I, uh, I partly agree to that because okay. still physician is given the maximum respect in this board, uh, yeah. as we have seen. And whenever there is a discordance, then they go back again to the physician. But it is okay. yet an evolving concept okay. from India. Okay. And I think everyone is learning. You know, I think in five years time, the tumor, molecular tumor boards will be much more you know, emphatic, yes, no, or, you know, they won't fall into the traps uh, and there's so many. So now I'm asking this question. Now, this is now coming for prostate cancer. So that was still general now for prostate cancer. Many of us, you know, treat many sites and prostate, we were not traditionally doing this thing. Now, suddenly the NCCN and, you know, papers in JCO, one after another, after another are coming. So uh, any, if you all want to vote, uh, if your voting system is working well, so clinical context when genomic or genetic analysis in prostate cancer patient is relevant to decide either risk stratification for conventional therapy, whether you give them or not, or just surveillance, and as well as precision therapy. So germline is multi-gene panel, including homologous recombination repair pathway and MMR genes. Tissue gene expression, RT-PCR, transcriptome, like Prolaris, Promark, Decipher, Oncotype, DX for prostate and or tissue and liquid biopsy multi-gene mutation analysis, which is a somatic with or without MSI for tumor mutation burden and androgen receptor V7. So for screen detected low risk prostate cancer at diagnosis, what would you say? A is little or no role, B is some role, uh, C is major role. So if you have done your voting, anyone, maybe round table two, what would you, A, B, C, For uh, in uh, screen for detected low risk, actually uh, little or no uh, no role. No role. Okay. Yeah. As we proceed further, when yeah. there is I think in our country it is no role because we get very few screen detected prostate cancer. Unlike in the West, where there is a flood of screen detected asymptomatic, you really do not know. So where they look at if patient has 
more than 10 or 20 years if it is very low risk more than 20 and life expectancy low risk more than 10 years then this helps you whether you treat them in active surveillance or you actually treat them with monotherapy or with multiple therapy so this is fine now intermediate risk prostate cancer at diagnosis robotic surgery done so in that patient is there any role uh, table uh, uh, three any one of you is there any urologist here in the audience no we have ignored them any any one of you no for intermediate risk i think there may be some role uh, depending upon if there is family history what is the histopathological yeah. presentation yeah so if there is family history high risk if patient has high risk prostate cancer at diagnosis and has had adt and radiotherapy on then yes yes high risk major yes. role yes so major role now metastatic castration naive prostate cancer as diagnosis at diagnosis i have and yes, yes. okay looks like overwhelming and now crpc metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer yes. definitely yes yes, yes. yes. All are yes. All are okay, yes. good. So except for, I think uh, you all have got it right. So I'm just asking for, now I'm talking about the pathway and genes. If you all, if your voting system, is it working? If people are doing it or just, I we don't waste time in that. I don't know. The questions are wrong. The, the options that are given, oh. they were given as somatic germline and this thing for each. It should have been some role, no role. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So we will, you know, because you finally want to get some consensus out of it or even the diversity of opinion. So same thing, you all can fill it, you know, uh, subsequently, uh, you know, after the meeting, because our time is also running out. So I'm asking, what is your first choice for germline testing for localized high-risk prostate cancer with a family history? First is only BRCA2 and uh, BRCA1 or all the major homologous recombination repair pathway genes, which include BRCA or HRR pathway and MMR pathway or a large panel which have all the genes of possible prognostic or therapeutic relevance or you find the evidence so confusing that you can't make up your mind. So just what is your first? Uh, I think uh, B, uh, we should go for uh, along B, with BRCA1. B, first yeah. choice. And yes. if what will be your second choice? Next question is the second uh, best. D. For the larger panel. Okay. So either HRR, all HRR or larger panel. Uh, yes. This table? Uh, sir, my first option would be B followed by A. Followed by A. Okay. B followed by A. The last table? The three? So Anyone? Up for D first. Uh, larger panel. D. Covered. Okay. okay. So really speaking, no one really knows what is the right approach. Because unless until we have data on thousands of patients and you have called actually now... The data I will show later, which actually guides you what you should be doing. But unless until I read those papers, I myself wasn't sure, you know, what's to be done. So you look at pragmatic logistics, how, what will cost patient more reflex testing one after another. But now there is data also to talk about. it. So the first and second choice we have discussed. Now we are talking about uh, germline testing in metastatic. So would you, would it be different when so initially was localized? Now it is cast castration naive any one of you would have a different approach for germline testing or same sir in last question what is your choice in my choice i will talk later because if i start talking about my choices okay so my choice originally would have been d as the first thing but after reading the paper i think the hrr pathway genes because the see what do you want to do in in uh, 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 sorry c C is covers basically everything or so your immunotherapy because 3% patient may have MMR gene pathway and remaining, you know, eight to 10% patient may have HRR pathway. They would cover everything. But really speaking, if you look at the data hardcore, it is only the BRCA2 mutation, which is making actually major clinical difference. Okay. So if someone is doing only BRCA2 and BRCA1, I can't really argue with them, you know, very hard based on data. I can't argue with them much, you know, in terms of, their, their intention is only clinical benefit for patient, nothing else. Okay. So I think we will, we have covered this thing. So in castration resistant as well as castration knife. So uh, I think most people would use the same approach or in different settings, you would do different things. So probably in the intermediate risk 
oh, we looked into the pathology as well. We looked into whether there is an intraductal or a cribriform. And when it comes to a localized high risk, mm. then uh, we go for a means BRCA2, BRCA1. But when it comes to metastatic CRPC, we are a little bit going to a larger panel like HRR, MMR, and other uh, therapeutic evidence. So we go yeah, extrapolate yeah. from the trial. Because by that time, you know, there could be other things also. It may not help you in therapy, but maybe sometimes prognosis or, you know, that also allows you to calculate tumor mutation burden and all. So, okay. But perhaps the uh, tendency, the Indian mindset as such, hmm. they would do the testing only once. Uh, they may not, you know, agree for cascade testing one after the that, other. I think that is also a very important point because patients already spent. You know, why you didn't tell us earlier? So that I think is an important uh, mindset of the patient. I think very, very quickly, let us go through. Now for somatic, okay. Now the issue comes, would you do only BRCA2 uh, and 1 or the again, the same thing. So which one for somatic uh, 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 table 1? D. Table two for somatic, if you have to. Somatic first and then. No, no. If you are doing somatic, I'm not saying somatic or germline. So which one? Uh, D panel or C or B? This is for D, breast D. cancer or, uh, or prostate? Only prostate we are talking about. Oh, so family history of breast. Patient prostate cancer with family history. Because they, they run together. Okay. So I think in the clinical setting, again, the data very few people have done only BRCA 2 and 1 uh, in uh, in somatic setting most people have had a larger channel at least all the HRR genes you know 10 or 15 genes so the comparative data is not there but I think it is pragmatic to do a large panel you know including all as many because they won't develop for you prostate cancer specific panel I think we will just uh, go through it now I'll just show you this is a systematic review of the prevalence of DNA damage uh, gene mutation. So they had looked at the prostate cancer and this is from the uh, germline mutation and the green one is somatic mutation. By doing somatic, you identify more mutations and uh, in metastatic CRPC, of course, uh, when you do somatic with a larger panel because you are doing, you will identify more mutation. And this is an ATM and it is in BRCA1. But if you look at the most important gene is the BRCA2 gene because in terms of response for prostate cancer. In prostate cancer, with when it is the BRCA2, the most important gene, whether you do germline or somatic, the number of mutation prevalence is same because BRCA2 is the real gene which is actually the driver for you know, hereditary or inherited genetic type of prostate cancer. So if you want to catch the real gene for therapeutic benefit or for everything else, then whether you do germline or somatic, there is little difference. But if you want to get a full spectrum of the HRR pathway, give the patient the benefit of, you know, PARP inhibitors and all for whatever its benefit it is, then of course doing a larger panel. So now I'm just showing what the NCC, and if you look at germline testing, it recommends for almost everything, you know, for very low risk to low risk. So you recommend, of course, in, in uh, very low risk and low risk, if there is a family history and otherwise, you know, whenever there is an inter, when it comes to in, uh, intermediate risk, when there's an introductory histology and uh, uh, in intermediate and of course, high risk, irrespective of anything, you do that. So almost, and in our setting, we get very few, very low risk and low risk patients. So in our setting, uh, it is, recommended it will become almost every second patient and all pathologists unless until they are euro pathologists euro onco pathologists they would not necessarily report on intraductal histology and many of us as clinician also we had not earlier given enough weightage to the intraductal histology and were not asked and they're not reported whereas for somatic uh, so this is for somatic biomarker analysis for very for low risk, deciding you know whether you can you can you need to do active surveillance, you can do or you have to treat the patient. That is where it is required. And intermediate because it can predict what will be the outcome, what will be the histology based on your robotic surgery. Because patients need to decide if I undergo robotic prostatectomy, what are the chances I may still require radiotherapy or may have other things. So this is where it is coming. But otherwise, what we have been thinking a patient has metastatic. So this is localized prostate cancer, not metastatic prostate cancer. It is not there. So NCCN guidelines, I've just sort of summarized basically anyone who has a family history, which is a high risk or very high risk or a metastatic prostate cancer, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, because they have a higher introductory histology. And whenever germline testing is to be done, 
they recommend that all the lynch syndrome genes with a mismatch repair and the homologous recombination gene they should be checked at least these genes so this is i'm just giving a what a genomic test result for prostate so fortunately we don't have to deal these men who are very anxious more than them then sometimes the wives are very anxious how whether my husband should be treated or not is that it tells you either active surveillance or use a single modality treatment or multi modality treatment based on what is the likelihood of this patient uh, having a disease specific whether the chances of dying from the prostate cancer so very quickly i'll take you all through a survey of urologists and urologists in us and actually revealed major gaps in knowledge and practices regarding germline testing for that and this had come after the nccn guideline which was widely publicized in us and even urologists see the nccn guideline i think everyone sees that and was it because of lack of knowledge or access to genetic counselor or they were not convinced with the ever expanding indication of germline testing for prostate cancer from not just nccn but others also have seen that so we want to know what the indian oncologists think about the practice so this was the question i am i mean i don't have time to do that so this they had asked the question so this is a guideline testing is clinically indicated for metastatic prostate cancer at any age you know with family history without family history and uh, uh, metastatic prostate cancer with braca mutation in tumor profiling somatic so whether you would do germline testing yes or no or don't as a say well i don't deal with this kind of patient so uh, table number 1 the tumor board 1 so metastatic prostate patient with family history of like a classical hboc you will do anyone who says no they won't do no again if you take it as a real scenario then the answers are different theoretical yes no be they asking in your practice you know at least you would refer you may not do it but you may refer so practice changes from place to place because even a medical college i will not do sir i don't have facilities logistics now in place no but Any... if if suppose that was not there you would have wanted to do yes then i will do so yeah. it differs practice to practice where we are see the other thing is now you know we are not referring okay so suppose someone has a metastatic prostate cancer and a strong family history you may not do it because patient can't afford but if you have not raised that query you have not even referred today the patient may not be there but 5 years down the line the patient's daughter may come and catch you that this is a classical hboc and did not advise and today i am sitting with advanced ovarian cancer yes amit you want to say something? i think sir in metastatic condition uh, at some point of time every patient will become crpc mm. so so a, a, a counseling or dialogue should be started when the patient become metastasis so that you may need it at the time of progression of the disease the report because report will take another 4 6 week to come sometime so what i do practice i at the time of metastatic when the patient we usually discuss and the at least send the somatic sample for because because by, by the time the you are right so recently we have started getting prostate patients for uh, you know for testing so that is good so i won't see there are many questions they have i won't i will directly show you the results finally so now this is germline testing for high risk localized uh, prostate cancer so they are high risk uh, you know and high grade uh, no family history and then when they have uh, with uh, uh, brother died of prostate cancer so becomes familial then it becomes uh, patient has a high grade uh, gleason score with a ashkenazi jewish ancestry then it is a individual uh, you know clinic when patient with first and second degree blood relatives with you know hboc type of cancers or intraductal prostate and the last is uh, a patient with a known pathogenic variant in a cancer susceptibility gene okay so i will now directly show the results of this so this is the us radiology so this was a survey they did and this is after the nccn guidelines what i have highlighted that the patients where you have a metastatic prostate cancer even if there is family history 14% patient urologist or urologist saying no i won't do it i think because they are not comfortable talking to that family if something comes up because you know i mean they are not there they are there to remove prostates by the robot not to talk about these things so it's a comfort level of the physician also and they haven't faced lawsuit these families haven't come uh, back to them and metastatic uh, prostate cancer braca on tumor profiling about again two thirds say so Uh, and you see about one quarter of all these you know urologists or urologists 
they are not even comfortable thinking about it. They say, well, we don't assess. Okay, forget about taking a decision. We don't get into this. Okay, so this is the reality of 2020 urologist and urologist in US. So if you all don't do it, don't feel bad. But of course, we have to improve things. So there are certain patients, if you don't do it, there could be consequences for the patient, for the family, and sometimes for you also. So this is just it. And again, so interductal. So only 12% majority feel that it may be interductal. I don't care. So there are papers which show that if it's an interductal, there's a high chance of germline mutation. But as of now, this knowledge either has not percolated or they know it, but they are not convinced that because they have been seeing interductal histology in so many patients. You know, this is to call it pains and other things. So they are not convinced. So now I'm asking this question, the yield and concordance between germline archival tumor tissue, germline archival tumor tissue and liquid biopsy, cell-free DNA. So the chances of finding the most clinically relevant genetic alteration, which is the best one, uh, germline testing on blood sample, somatic testing on uh, archival tumor tissue, liquid biopsy, or there's not much to choose between. And then again, I'm asking, the first is the most clinically relevant magic, when I say most means, uh, yeah, most, which is the most important. And the second is maximum number of clinically relevant genetic alterations. So both the choices. So uh, number two, when you talk of most clinically relevant, actually it will depend upon the sample platform use techniques because there is a bias when we do NGS. Yeah. When the when we're doing NGS test on the tumor tissue, yeah. Uh, things are different, and if you extract DNA from the blood and do that is the easiest. Yeah. So. So technically, the result that you get is much more. From blood, it will be uh, maximum clinically relevant as well as most clinically relevant findings will come from germline. Yeah. If you have a good technique to extract DNA or RNA from yeah. the tumor tissue, then uh, things will be different. Of course. But all these are clear approved tests and you know they are run in this, all the results that I'll be showing you, they have been done in not in a research setting, but in, but in clear approved labs. So that is what I'm talking of. So what you see is, I'm just quickly show the results because we have, uh, so this is the concordance. The green ones are concordant and uh, uh, the gray ones are partial concordance and the red ones are discordant. So 72 men with a DNA damage response alteration, primary samples with paired circulating tumor DNA and or metastatic tissues were sequenced. And primary tumor represents action. So I'm not talking of germline versus somatic that I had shown earlier in the earlier slides. So which is actually it is revealing to me also that the primary tumor represents actionable mutations, which is retained most of, again BRCA2 if you look at the which is the most important genes as we have shown I will show a slide later there were only one or two cases where the primary tumor archival tissue had missed a BRCA2 mutation which was picked up by you know uh, 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 circulating tumor uh, uh, DNA or uh, by uh, other method or a biopsy from the uh, metastatic cancer so if Sometimes you feel bad, okay, there is no biopsible lesion. We have to use the old archival tumor. Of course, in our country, the way it is fixed and stored in paraffin embedded, everything that could alter. So this is for US, the way histopathology is done there. I do not know what will be the findings there. So I think some of us should, those who have a large practice should do that. So in deciding, uh, I think I'll, uh, I'm just coming uh, we have less time. So in deciding therapy in castrate, now we're talking of the CRPC, which is the most difficult. So which one would you give major consideration, minor consideration, or no consideration at all? So one is BRCA2, BRCA1, other HRR genes, just few minutes because we lost in this uh, tech, uh, technology, MMR genes, uh, high TMB androgen receptor gene or BRCA1 to reversion mutation. So just number one, what will be your most important? BRCA2. BRCA2. I think I've already said that so many times. Yes, so I think BRCA, there's... Next is BRCA1. Next German. is BRCA1. Okay. Then is HRR. Then okay. MRR. Also. Okay. So again, I won't go into details. So, so people only talk about PARP inhibitors, you know, HRR for PARP inhibitors and MSI or DMMR for, you know, uh, immune checkpoint blocker. But at least, at least the real world is a little different. If you look at in this study, what they looked at, a uh, prospective cohort study of impact of germline DNA repair on the outcomes of uh, uh, CRPC. And 
in this what they found they were looking at just with the last line you look at so some patient had either a germline mutation or do not had germline mutation in which brca2 significant interaction between germline brca2 status and treatment time so androgen signaling inhibitors versus taxanes both cause specific survival so if they had a germline brca2 they did much better as compared to if they did not have a uh, germline brca2 so it has real this was in jcu uh, you know a couple of years ago so look at when you have a brca2 carrier whereas atm brca1 other germline ddr gene whether it was there or not there at in metastatic setting it did not make a difference so this is uh, important now this is for again we normally don't think so uh, this was androgen receptor splice variant so if the variant is there it truncates the protein so androgen receptor is not there for binding and in what they found that in metastatic uh, prostate cancers who were started on abiraterone or enzulatamide if they had a truncated uh, arv7 by 2 ctc methods one was john hopkins other was i forget the name of that and both of them correlated strongly with progression free as well as overall survival so this is something which you don't always think we don't do we don't have access to but something which could make a difference then even for patients who have radium 223 it made a big noise uh, you know big splash few years ago even them because the, how the it works radiation works they had much better overall survival if they had a germline mutation just last slide i would say racial difference all the data is from west even in somatic we think germline could be different even at somatic level if you look at copy number alteration there were major difference between different races african americans we know they have early onset and more aggressive prostate cancers they die early also they are generally not put on surveillance and even the tumor looks very different the copy number alteration so how indian men that our prostate tumors would be i do not know something in between caucasian and uh, african americans we have no idea so there is data need to uh, produce our own data this is my last slide and just one one any one of you could say what would you do if your patient doesn't does not have access to or not willing to go for expert genetic counseling you feel this patient should need detailed genetic counseling lot of issues but they won't go or they just don't have access document it document it and allow him to do okay. choose what so he wants so your point is document it i think you can close let the him PPT. choose let him choose what he wants to do okay Could so no online genetic consultation yes. nowadays is online a... yes that is one thing but again see the patient and the family it works very well you know awesome. telegenetic counseling he doesn't want to online <laughs> no they may but so there is an option so earlier we never used to have that so online is one thing any one of you one more thing he may not want but this next generation may be wanting so no you are talking son. to the patient who is in front of you the no, next generation is not come tell your son to come or some the we can just stress the importance that is yes. one it should be documented huh? hmm. okay yeah what what are you saying uh, thing is that we should stress the importance of this counseling to that patient yeah. that should be documented one because he may not be interested at that point of time due to n number of reasons but if he understands the importance he or his family will come back and there are okay. relatives and family at risk most of the lawsuits have been by the family member of the deceased patient because they say i am getting this major surgery because you did not tell my now one thing you know mainstreaming of genetic counseling and genetic testing there is no way any oncologist cannot escape so you have to learn the basics and at least at basic level counseling and advice about testing this this you just cannot escape maybe 2021 you can escape 22 you can escape 2023 2025 20, no way some of us will retire we will probably you know go away but all the youngsters have no way but to get into mainstreaming of genetic testing thank you